down the hammer and pick up the pencil. You're about to listen to the Savvy Radio Show. Learn from real life real estate investors, experience revealed with the Savvy Landlord as your host. Good afternoon. I am Dina Jones Cox, and this is Real Life Real Estate Investing, where this week, as every week, we're working our fingers to the bone to make sure you get the information and inspiration you need to start or grow your own real estate investing business. And today we're going to talk about a topic that we have not talked about a lot here on Real Life Real Estate over the years, commercial real estate. Why have we not talked about it a lot? Because I'm not, you guys are mostly residential real estate investors. And when people say commercial real estate, you get all, oh, no, that's too much money. I'm just a little guy. I don't know how to do that. I like my houses. But I also know that a lot of you lately have been saying words out of your face like, oh, man, maybe I should be looking into something other than single family homes and apartments because they all seem really overpriced for the interest rates I can get and the rents I can get and the taxes has gone up and the insurance has gone up and there must be something more profitable. I wonder if I should look at commercial real estate. (laughs) You know, there's actually a lot of people who've made that transition over the years. And if you, uh, listen to them now. They, they, they all look at the rest of us and say, why are you guys still messing around with houses, commercial real estate? It turns out to be so much better. It's like, it's like they've discovered religion and they want to tell us all that they used to be backsliders like us, but now they have found the real truth. And I don't know, maybe they have. My guest today is a perfect example of one of those people. You guys might remember Steve Van Cowenberg from an interview I did with him probably seven or eight years ago where he was talking about residential real estate management. I mean, he was like the guy for rental properties back then, and I called him about a year ago and said, hey, Steve, you want to come and speak at the National Summit? And he was like, oh, I don't really do that anymore. (laughs) And I said, well, what do you do? And he said, oh, man, I'm 100% into commercial real estate. So, um, yeah, we're going to hear that story and the pros and cons of transitioning to commercial real estate and how he did it and how you might want to as well. He's joining us by phone from his home in Oklahoma. Steve, welcome to Real Life Real Estate. Dina, I'm... I've always appreciated you, even when I first saw you, what, 15 years ago, the Wholesale Queen, (laughs) or (laughs) I've learned so much from you. It's an honor to be, anytime you ask me to do anything, I'll be there. Well, regardless. And, and and I truly appreciate that. Um, although like you, my, my personal uh, investment interests have evolved a lot (laughs) since you saw me 15 years ago. Uh, I do still wholesale properties, but I am way more interested in buying them to hold. Unless, of course, by the end of this program, you've talked me into doing commercial instead, which I guess isn't entirely yeah. possible, given that absolutely. you just absolutely love it. And you, you're a smart guy. So I'm going to listen and find out why you love it. So. Um, let's start okay. out for, for long time listeners with you explaining how, when and why you made this huge shift. I mean, it was, it was a 180 degree turn from residential into commercial. Okay. Yes. Well, how, how it started, like, I think everyone else should dabble in it. But in 2011 was when I bought my first apartment. But it was 14 units as a boutique a property, but I didn't I didn't really consider that commercial. Mm-hmm. It's until probably several years ago when I realized there's these four types of commercial properties, which is multifamily, industrial, office, and retail. You can call those types of real estate commercial real estate. Mm-hmm. But the main the main gist I think that we just stay in single family because it's easier. And in the commercial world, there's just a lot different nuances and language. 
And I just dug my heels in and said, hey, I, I want to learn this. It's like a trade. Like, if you wanted to be a woodworker, you want to know what a lathe does. And I think what people hold people back is, yes, there's a lot more nuances to it, but it's only going to elevate you and your returns. But the simplistic reasons are bigger returns, number one. Number two, cash flow. Bigger and faster equity upside. They, it just, it's just a bigger Titanic. Mm-hmm. And you, and if you are at a certain point with, say, you have 30, 50, 100 units and you're cash flowing a lot, you can depreciate and go against and you can do a cost segregation. There's so many things you can do with commercial. You're constantly paying down bigger numbers and it's a tangible asset that you can scale. And if you get to the holy grail of, um, what's that called off the top of my head? I can't think of it. Um, in the hood. Uh, Oh my gosh. <laughs> no, like when someone pays everything, a triple net lease. Uh-huh. I mean, I have I have several of those that I don't, I mean, they're just running the ground. And I, ha- I own a family dollar, and they pay $7,500 a month, plus taxes, plus insurance. So like you said earlier on the, on the call, you know, your taxes are going up. You're, it's hurting all single family. I They're all going up. But that that cost is passed on to the tenant. So family dollars paying more in insurance, family dollars paying more in taxes, not me. I'm still cash flowing like a machine. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Now let's see. So that's, that's the main reasons why. But the thing is, is it's just, a, it's like a barrier of entry. There's just, there's just time and essence that you have to understand to get over there. Mm-hmm. But in a nutshell, it's just, it's just bigger and it's classier. The people you're dealing with, it's, how I compare it is like single family is kind of a certain type of people. And on the commercial side, it's 100% professionalism. There is no ghetto. There is no, you go to court and you're fighting with someone. It's not like that. It's, these are rules and laws that are in the commercial arena that professional people abide by. Well, there, me- you know, if you go to a eviction court, for single family, you don't know what you're going to get. Uneducated landlords that don't know the law, that don't know that they need to serve a five-day eviction notice, they don't know anything about what's going on, but they're a landlord. But the judge, the court system, looks at them as a professional, looks at them, you should know this, you're not honoring your profession. On the commercial side, it's not like that at all. Let me play devil's advocate and say that with bigger numbers, right, so, so you know, mm-hmm. you're saying you're saying, well, you get bigger numbers, you get bigger cash flow, you get more depreciation because you paid more for the property. I mean, it's just <laughs> you get more sure. depreciation because it's just a, a bigger dollar figure. But with all that stuff, also comes bigger risk. Mm-hmm. I feel like I'm I feel, I feel like I'm putting more at risk if I um, borrow nine million dollars to buy a ten million dollar commercial property than if I buy ninety thousand dollars if I borrow ninety thousand dollars to buy a hundred thousand dollar commercial property. And I think that's what makes most residential real estate investors kind of leery of commercial. Do you feel like it's bigger risk or not? No, I I mean the numbers are scary, but if you, you if you're insecure about those numbers, you can go in with the partnerships. You can you know, do it together and, and spread your risk across four or five people or a group or you can syndicate. I mean, but, you know, the simple cliche, the bigger the risk, the bigger reward. But, I, I mean, in my mind, it's the same. You're going to get sued on a single family. I, I love that you, you can have 100 units and never be sued and go through life great. Or you can own one unit and be sued by one tenant and your wife, your life could be just a nightmare. I think that there's risk in just driving down the road with people on their cell phones all day, text messaging Mm -hmm. some 16 year old girl. I mean, it's just, I I don't know. If you're a true entrepreneur, it it, it doesn't matter. I mean, it's just, you just have to get over it. And and, and I make it sound easy. Yes. It took many years for me to bite the bullet and, you know, convince myself to do it. And, you know, when you were, the question you asked me, you know, when did you make the leap? And, you know, I was looking at, you know, when did I buy my first commercial property and how did all this work out? Well, it took a long time. It, it, it was, I've been dabbling since 2011, but when I really sunk down was three years ago and I just made the commitment. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm only going to do, I'm not going to look at single family anymore. I'm only going to look at commercial. Mm-hmm. In commercial, 
you can get, you can assume loans much easier. You can do a lot more creative. And if you like, like that simple million dollar property, some, some banks are probably going to require 20%. They don't really care where you get that money from. If you have a, a net worth or a financial statement that's within reason, you can go borrow $200,000 somewhere else from somebody else, like a hard money loan, and acquire that million dollar asset with 20% down. I mean, there's just a lot of things. There's just a lot more wiggle room in my mind. But it's, it is, you just, it's just a psychological thing you just have to overcome. It's like asking someone out on a date. You're going to feel rejected. You're just going to have to push yourself and go, I'm going to go do it. And what's the worst thing that could happen? You um, don't get the deal? All right. So so we're going to continue to explore this after we take a break. But um, ladies and gentlemen, I know almost nothing about commercial real estate. If you have questions about commercial real estate, this is the day to ask them. You can do that by calling in during the show. If you're listening to this on on Real Life Real Estate dot com it's not during the show anymore and you shouldn't call this number yes we we repost these but try and remember if you're listening live or not if you're listening live give us a call at 877-772-9658 again 877-772-9658 or send it across the email at askvina at gmail.com Welcome back to Real Life Real Estate Investing. I'm your host, Vina Jones-Cox, talking today to Steve Van Cowenberg, who, um, yeah, betrayed us all by becoming a fully commercial real estate investor <laughs> about three years ago, dabbled around in it before that. Um, and by the way, if you're seriously considering uh, commercial real estate, uh, you're not going to, please do not listen to a radio show and then go, okay, I'm going to go buy myself a, you know, hotel. Okay. Don't, don't do that. Um, as ever, as with everything there, there are nuances that you need to learn about. There's practicalities you need to learn about. If you'd like some more education on it, I'd like to issue an official uh, invitation to tomorrow night's RIA of greater Cincinnati online national chapter meeting. They, our third Thursday of the month meeting, uh, is always on Zoom. And tomorrow night, we've got a, another commercial investor who used to be a residential investor, Tom Barry. Uh, he works uh, actually on, uh, very different kinds of properties than Stephen does. And he, because he's got like, you know, Zoom and can have slides, he can actually show you stuff like how these properties are evaluated. Uh, what what listings look like stuff like that's really hard to do on the radio it's, like I didn't even I didn't even send you a question about evaluating property Stephen because going well here's what you do you take the NOI which you calculate by blah 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 it's really hard to do on the radio mm-hmm. it's much easier when there's a screen in front of you uh, somewhere so if you want to uh, attend that ladies and gentlemen uh, you just have to get a link and you can do that by registering at CincinnatiRia.com that's Cincinnati reia.com that meeting actually starts at 6:30 eastern time with a na- nationwide haves and wants meeting and then Tom will be on about 7:15 eastern time for those of you who are not listening from the eastern time zone just you know set your watch accordingly um so <clears throat> Stephen you mentioned that there are four four kinds of commercial properties that there are you said um apartments office Warehouse, uh, office, industrial, industrial, and retail. Retail, and mm-hmm. I, I just want to, I just want to put that apartment ones to the side for the for the yeah. purpose of this uh, call because I don't like them. <laughs> well, to me, to me, if it's got beds, and 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 if Fannie Mae will finance it, I don't quite understand why we're calling it commercial, right? If people are sleeping there. <laughs> You know, pe- people put uh, trailer parks into the category of commercial as well, and I'm like, well, but I mean, you still have residential tenants. Yes, you you own the land and you're renting the land, but you may also be renting the home, and you've got residential tenants, and so the, that that's not different in the way that owning retail or office spaces, where nobody is spending, hopefully, <laughs> nobody is spending the night um, <clears throat> in your or showering in your uh, units, so. Is there a certain one of those other three classes that you like to focus on? 
Yes. <clears throat> I, and one thing that a lot of people need to think about, too, is, you know, single tenant. I had a, a successful real estate single family guy. I'm never going to get in commercial because it's a single tenant. And so you need to think that way, too. Yes, if that tenant does leave, you will have a little bit longer holding cost. So just keep that in mind. Multifamily, you know, you spread your risk a little bit. In industrial, you can too. Uh, the, the properties that I enjoy are retail and industrial. Those are the ones that I love, and those are the ones that work really well. I'm not a big fan of office. It always seems to be a struggle. Even before COVID, it was a struggle to lease this thing out. It's a big ship of pain. I have like 20-something units in a three-story, 11,000-square-foot office space. It's not, it's not easy to get tenants in general. But when you do get tenants, here's the thing that you need to really consider. They have vested interest in what they're doing. A tenant can just go move somewhere else, like a residential tenant. There's, there's a lot, but a business tenant may it be a entrepreneur or a retail avenue, they're not going to leave because it would hurt their business. So they're vested. So you can have a building and they they decorate it the way they want to. You have this thing called TI, tenant improvements, and they come in and put in a restaurant and they invest forty thousand, fifty, a hundred and fifty thousand dollars into the building for their restaurant. They're going to sign a 10-year lease, a nine-year lease, and they don't plan on leaving because they make money off of your building. It's a win. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I like about it. We're a team. We're going in together. Yeah, you are the tenant. I am the landlord. But we're trying to win together. In residential, it's, it's like I'm the big bad landlord and you're the tenant. You pay me. And please don't dirty my place. You know, it's just a different level of thinking. Mm -hmm. I so think it feels it so feels cooperative I, instead of adversarial. Um, Stephen, uh, we we need to <clears throat> divert from the questions I was going to ask you and uh, take a couple of calls, okay. uh, starting with sure. Jonathan, who's calling from Miami. Jonathan, welcome cool. to Real Life Real Estate. Hey, Bina, how are you? I'm good, Jonathan. How are you? Great. Looking forward to the uh, session up in Columbus. Oh, fun. I'll see you there. So, so do you <laughs> so have a question, the question for Steve? For Steve was, mm -hmm. Yeah. So, like, considering the diversity of buildings, businesses, tenants, um, you know, from a bird's eye view, and, and by the way, there was a really good post today from uh, Anna Kelly uh, who posted something that David Phelps had, uh, had also uh, published some article about uh, syndications. It was. It was. It's a worthwhile and relative to this conversation about what to get into. You know what, what to be careful of. What can happen. It's a really interesting article. But I'm um, getting back to the question. Uh, considering the diversity of buildings, businesses, and tenants, like what's a bird eye, bird's eye view of how to approach confirming an opportunity is worth investigating for you? Ooh, great question, Jonathan. Because I'll tell you. I'll, I'll tell you, Stephen. Well, okay, but, but let, let's, let's, let's even step back from that because I think, I think the question Jonathan is asking is if you go to one of the commercial listing services, you know, you go to LoopNet okay. or something similar to that. Sure. And even if Coast you just, are, even if, one. yeah, yeah. And if you just even say, I, I just want to see everything in, uh, Hamilton County, Ohio, there are hundreds and hundreds <laughs> and hundreds okay. of, of different kinds of properties. How do you sort of ID, okay, well, here's the five, okay. like, what would you look for to say, well, here's five that look super interesting and I should do Perfect. more investigation on? Okay, so I'm really lazy. So I try to find property that I can already have a tenant lined out for. So it's like I try to pre-lease the building before I buy it. And when I do it that way, then I can get funding and I show the bank or whatever I need the funding from. I already have it pre-leased. Okay, so so so, so wait a minute. Do you 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 start with a tenant, like you go out and look for a business that's looking for yeah. a place to live, and then you yeah, like there's a there's a franchise right now that in Oklahoma a friend of mine owns called Nectar. It's a juice bar, and I'm trying to find him a strip center that I can purchase and he can be the tenant. Oh my goodness! So it just. <laughs> 
but I like I own a, a, a seven thousand square foot retail um, building on a main drag. That that how I got that building was because the tenant was displaced and he had RC cars, and I used to bring my RC car up there. And he's like, I have to move the 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 building is sold and I got to leave. And I found him a building and I got him to sign the lease and I brought that lease and I brought that building to the bank and closed it. And the guy moved in and I have not touched that building in over five years. And it's a, it's a complete triple net lease. So it's a tenant's first approach. You go out cause I, cause I know one of the things that I do know about commercial real estate is that tenants and particularly the kind of a to B tenants that you want, have really specific requirements about, and sure. you, you mentioned some of them. It needs to be on a street that has at least uh, 20,000 traffic count a day, or it, <clears throat> it has it. to have yeah. um, parking for at least 54 cars. I mean, they, they know what they yeah. want, and yeah. <clears throat> you're taking the approach of find the person who wants a place and can pay for it, and then that makes it easy to left swipe all the properties that wouldn't fit for that tenant, and then you just go negotiate yeah. on the one that would. So, like, if you have a good broker, which I recommend, and we can talk about that later, but how to how to have a relationship with a good broker, that broker is representing that retail establishment, but that retail establishment has a business model to lease. They don't want to own for tax purposes. Great. Well, I have a business model I want to own for tax purposes. So you find a really good broker that can bring you two together. He has a franchise that needs to come into Oklahoma City. I have money and I want to buy a building. Let's work together. That's one strategy that I use all the time. Wow. That's <clears throat> another strategy I do too is like, um, I love flex space, which is like metal building with a, with a roll up door with a small little office. And you can build those between, uh, 75,000 to 150,000 for a thousand square foot space, which is reasonably uh, cost effective for a trade business like a plumber or a uh, electrical contractor HVAC those folks don't have the credit or the capital to just go buy a building or build a building and I like to be the conduit in that situation as well where I can provide that need for them and then eventually sell it to them later and that's, um, that's something that I've been working on for a while, for a couple of years now. And so in that case, what and you're looking built, for isn't an existing building. You're looking for land in, appropriate, in an appropriate yes. location. Ah. Yeah, and we just built 17 of those units, and we pre-sold and pre-leased those to trades. And then some, some wealthy people bought them for their toys, but they're basically overinflated garages that people can run their business out of it. So commercial is really a, a, a creative ground that you can do anything with and it's professional and and the city sees it's professional they want it to happen because it's more revenue for them the the banks need to lend and they're it's just a, a you know that project's like a two million dollar project so that's a great loan for them to write there's only they're only writing one loan versus you know eight little fifty thousand dollar loans or what, whatever the number comes up but you, you, you see this. You see the difference there. <laughs> well, uh, that that that, that that's that sound you heard a minute ago was my mind being blown, because <laughs> this is well. I mean, this is. I had I had said before, you know, risky, 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 and it, it was because my only experience in commercial properties, uh, other than flipping a few. Uh, it had to do with my father having a mixed use, a commercial apartment, a commercial on the bottom, apartments on the top. And when one of his stores went vacant, it could stay vacant for a year because it was, it, you know, it was what it was, finding the right person to move into what was relatively a small space and then ha- qualifying them. It's a, a year's worth of lost rent, right? But you're kind right. of taking the opposite approach, which is let's find the person with the need. I need to put my business somewhere. Let's find out what he wants to pay and what he wants. And then let's go find it for him. And then let's take him and the building to the bank who's now like, oh, you've already got a tenant for it? Okay. <laughs> awesome. Uh, that's that's way different than the way things are normally done in residential real estate. Is it syndicated, though? Yeah, I, do, you, do you syndicate or do you do it by yourself? That, well, that, that one was by myself. You can... 
and the great thing about that project was you can pre-sell those units and there's investors that I had lined up. They're like, yeah, I can buy this for a hundred thousand dollars and I can rent it out for twelve thousand, twelve hundred dollars a month. Sure. I'll commit to that. I mean, there's so many ways to win in commercial. It doesn't have to be all about you. That's what's, that's why I don't like a residential anymore. It's about the landlord and about the tenant. So, in commercial, it, everyone wins in my mind. So, Jonathan, it wasn't that he it wasn't that he had to raise money for a down payment. It was that he already had people who were under contract to buy some of these from him. Yes. Once he got closed, which effectively raised the money for the down payment. And there's cost. Right, if they got the, like they they got the money plans. to actually do that, but. No, no, no. What he's renting, like, I mean, no, 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 no. He's talking about investors agreed to pre-buy some of these buildings from him uh, once he had the land and the building built and the tenant. It's like it's like if I said to you, "Hey, I'm gonna, I've, I've got this great deal on a house, and once I get a tenant in it, it's going to cash flow five thousand dollars a month. Would you like to agree to buy it now? I mean, I'm not going to ask you for money now because I don't have the house yet." But would you like to buy it now for a hundred thousand dollars? You're going to say yes, right? And you're going to sign a contract saying you'll buy it for a hundred thousand dollars to make five thousand dollars a month in cash flow. I mean, yeah, I'm, but next year was a rental. So how do you pre? How do you get a lease when you don't have a building? And then if you're doing rental, no, but that, that's a separate deal. That was a separate deal. That we're talking about a new construction on a flex space to get that with no money to get that built. Yeah. And then that tenant would reap that new tenant. I mean, that 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 investor would reap that tenant. Now on the RC car place, I had to, you know, I had to have some down money, which I leveraged other property and cross collateralized that to get that that seven thousand square foot retail space, and that tenant moved in. But the bank was like, I did have no delays in getting the funding because I already had it pre leased. That's just a. I just prefer to have it pre-leased or pre-sold or something's going on before I don't just willy-nilly buy a commercial property unless it's some smoking deal and every time that's happened, it's hurt me. <laughs> so I just don't do that anymore. Yeah, so pre-lease meaning... How do you pre-lease it? How do you pre-lease a building you don't yet own? Okay, so like, for example, you you go on you can go on loopnet.net right now, okay, and there is pe- there's a ton of these out there that are pre... you know. He, you can pre-lease this property. You're you're advertising before I close. So I got the property under contract. Now, prior before I was looking for the property, I, I had the tenant in place. He was being displaced from another building. I knew this individual because I brought my car, my little car there. He was telling me, we're closing. I've got to find a new building. I called a commercial broker. I said, hey, I need a 5,000 to 10,000 square foot building. It needs to be in this price range. And he went out and found me that building. When I found that building, I had that new displaced tenant go look at the building, make sure you like this thing, because when we're when I get this sold closed, you're moving in. He went and toured the building. We worked out the scope of work. He said, okay. I was like, sign this piece of paper that you're going to commit to five years. Okay, he signs it, notarizes mm-hmm. it. In commercial, everything's notarized. Just get that out of your head now. Everything's notarized. There's no gains. There's no word of mouth. It's notarized. I take that to the bank and the, the package to purchase the property. They look at it. It's a no problem there. I still have to put money down, though. Okay, It, it technically was a no money down because I leveraged some other properties to put that no money down, down the the hundred thousand dollars I needed to put down on that property, but still it was a slam dunk, and the guy's been in there for over five years now, and I've never touched it. It's a triple net lease property. Yeah, he's making and- money. He has his cars there. He, you know, he's super happy. I'm like. It's a no money down. Stephen, I think I'm- I think what we I think what we have here is a jargon issue. When residential okay. when residential landlords hear pre lease, what what they hear is like I own the property, I know my tenant's moving next month, so I'm gonna you know, I'm gonna advertise it for okay. pre lease, meaning, you know, you can we, we can sign a lease now, you can't move until next month. What you mean by pre lease is they sign a commitment to lease the property contingent upon you buying the property <laughs> and making the improvements, yeah. of course. It's not like they start paying you rent before you buy the property. So I think 
sure. I think that our, our issue uh, here is one of, of just same word in two different languages kind of thing. And um, sure. I, I think, makes sense. I, think well, I, I understand it now. So, Jonathan, I appreciate your questions. We actually are uh, up against a break here, which we are going to take and then come back to Michael, who is calling from Connecticut. You're listening to Real Life Real Estate Investing, talking today about commercial, true commercial, no beds, real estate. You can give us a call at 877-772-9658 or send a question to askvina at gmail.com. Welcome back to Real Life Real Estate Investing. We're talking today about commercial property with Stephen Cowenberg, and I wasn't sure how this was going to go because, um, <laughs> you know, it, it's not it's not residential property. Uh, but apparently, we're on to something here because uh, Steve, there's no way I'm getting to the questions that I was going to ask you. <laughs> we have to go to okay. uh, line two and talk to Michael in Connecticut. Michael, welcome to Real Life Real Estate. Oh, hi. Uh, yes. Um, uh, thank you so much. It, uh, actually, to us, um, uh, uh, congratulations for getting involved in, in that, uh, making the jump. Mm-hmm. And I also want to say and thank you for the uh, discerning between the different classes, particularly in the industrial, because I read a lot of articles that say, oh, commercial, like it's all lumped as one. It's totally not. Mm-hmm. And, of course, it also depends where you are and the location. So coming to the questions... Uh, first one is, uh, how or are the changes with the Board of Realtors on the residential uh, broker side affecting commercial brokers? And I, yeah, I don't, to answer that, I, I don't, I think it's, again, the laws are different on the commercial side. So I don't, okay. the, the commission so probably know like, then. It's, yeah. No. Yeah, people I don't pay on on the on, on the commercial side. Just so you know, people pay for service, so mm-hmm. it, it's it's automatic. Like you sign a mm-hmm. lease, it's six percent usually to that broker, and you're dealing with brokers. Okay. You're not really dealing with agents. That's another kind of a nuance mm-hmm. that we need to understand. This this individual is a broker. They they are committed okay. to the the field. The barrier of entry is much higher to be a broker versus a real estate agent that just got their license trying to navigate the legalities of of what they should be doing. Yeah, okay. and, and and my experience is when I meet commercial agents, they don't actually belong to the National Association of Realtors. Right. You do, they don't okay. even know what okay. the MLS is. Yeah, they, they just they, they don't even know what the MLS is. They're not playing the same game as residential agents are yeah. at all. Okay. And besides the, also the um, <clears throat> retail, like you said, like the win-win, I thought that was an excellent point about the, with retail and other businesses. Uh, you mentioned, touched a bit about the license far Better than having to go to court, et cetera, what else would you say was different you know, about it between the two different classes? Avoiding like the the four different types caveats. Like what? Like well, I mean like the caveats. Quickly, of the caveats of, of residence, residential versus yeah, and the four different. Types. So, um. So just just well, high high level difference headache. between residential and commercial. Okay. Oh. Okay. okay. So. Yeah. Well, here quickly, like appreciation, you can leverage. Um, there's a lot more tax benefits multiple streams mm-hmm. of income the, the relational aspect is totally different the rias are different they're it's in, it's interesting okay. you get limited wear mm-hmm. and tear you know there's not a lot of transitional they're they're going to stay um mm-hmm. limited hours yeah. of operation usually it's 9 to 5 mm-hmm. um it's an income producing asset at all times like you're buying an atm machine so it, it has to, the way you run the numbers and evaluate commercial is based on how much money it spits out. People are so emotional in re, single uh, residents, residential is because mm. it, it's certain neighborhood or certain size and you could be a bad cool. landlord yeah. and, and charge less rent. But on, on commercial, yeah. if, it, if it only makes $5,000 a month, it's only worth uh, that cap rate. And let's say it's only worth five, you know, 500,000. It's only worth what the machine throws off. 
And that's that's the other thing that I think people need to really understand is like, it's cool if you're a bad landlord or a bad investor and you own an asset and only throws off a thousand dollars a month. That's all I'm going to be willing to pay in evaluation in a cap rate of what it's throwing off, not the potential, not the performa. What I think it's going to do. That's the value play you do as a commercial investor. Yes, my goal is to increase the value of the property, which with my hard work, I should yield a bigger return. But I'm not paying for that return because you're a bad investor and I'm only making $1,000 a month. I'm only paying what you're going to what it spits out right now. The rookie investors buy on Performa, which is sinful. You should only buy, mm-hmm. this mother is only producing this much income. This is what it's worth. Mm-hmm. Triple net lease are okay. amazing. Compare, you can't get that in single family. Here's another one. Gets, let's put our hands together in Ohio. The laws are stronger for commercial. Like, if you don't pay your rent in commercial, I can lock you out, sell all your assets to cover the rent. Mm. Welcome to the club. Wow. So, in, <laughs> okay. you know, if COVID hits. COVID hits, yeah, I got to wait six months and I can't evict you because some administration says you you can't do that. In commercial, if you don't pay, you're out. And if you don't get out, I'll lock you out and I will sell your contents for the rent. It's legal. And you get to grow faster. Depends on what your goals are. I mean, Mm -hmm. you only need, what, three or four commercial properties and you should have a good lifestyle. How many... Single family homes do you need to make ten thousand dollars a month? You only need two or three in commercial. But to get ten thousand yeah. dollars a month and in, in, in a two hundred dollar a month, I mean, how many ten, twenty, thirty properties? I don't know. I mean so yeah, that's why a lot more. I like commercial. But it, it took a long time. You can do it. It's just it's just a mind shift. You just gotta start mm. you know, it's I think single family is a great baseline. And I, I would not be where I am if it wasn't for single family, and I'm honored to be in that arena. But the commercial, it's, a, it's, it's worth the energy. It's worth the effort. Start learning it. Start reading about it. And, and mm-hmm. start making going towards that direction. Okay, great. Thank you. And what about due diligence? The last question. What about the due diligence? We were talking about, like, foot or auto traffic or that. Or how would you go there about it? There you go. There you go. Like, yeah. You're my you're, you're you're in my um in my wheelhouse. Okay? Mm-hmm. So let's cover let's cover due diligence. Is if that's okay? <laughs> Avina? Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> go ahead. Okay. All right. Let's go. Um first of all, you you got to there's so much to this like the title policy, the title commitment, the control, the the documents prior are totally different than than residential so mm. that that's one thing you always have to do a survey and a study the number one thing is like what's the best use of this property when i first got into commercial i was always trying to fit a peg into a, a square and i realized another way better investor taught me what if what would it look like if you scraped the building and just the land and so you have to do a you know a, a cost study like mm-hmm. what what can what's the maximum I can get on this land, this dirt, this building? Mm. You got to, of yeah. course, the legal description is is important, just like residential zoning. You can get stung in zoning. Like a lot of people will buy property thinking they can convert it into multifamily. You, you really you you've got to get a good attorney on your team that is a commercial real estate individual. You cannot be casual mm. in this game. There's covenants, conditions, restrictions. I can go on and on. <laughs> like, mm. you, you know, yep. the, the bank requires a phase one, a phase two reports. And what those are, those are environmental reports. And if you're getting a loan, they have to be done. Um, God. Those are, yeah, those are, you e- know, those are you EPA to, level reports right there. Yes. <laughs> And I've, I've gone all the way to a phase three where I, I was trying to buy this building that had a dry cleaner in the 50s and they were pouring chemicals in the back and oh. we had to bore yeah. a bunch of holes. It was a nightmare. And I had to walk from that deal. Mm-hmm. I lost $20,000 on that transaction. But you mm-hmm. learn. It was a good lesson. I learned another degree. Um, yeah. 
you you really need to do your this call the trailing twelve, but you really need to like the the op. Here's one thing that whoever's listening, you need to know this. Expect the seller to not tell you the truth. <laughs> it, 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 I mean, just they're going to be liars. I'm, I'm, Everything I'm laughing because you're right. <laughs> Yep. You you they're must. Get, rid of it. get out of there. They're going to send you a bill. They're going to say your electricity. You have to call the the electrical company. You have to dig and find all the bills. You have to hire a contractor to climb the roof. Don't trust anything. You have to verify everything. It's a process. Mm-hmm. You will get stung yeah. if you just haphazardly trust somebody. You have to sign off. It's your responsibility. Mm-hmm. And in in some of these smaller, in some of these smaller, you know, a strip center that's got five storefronts, right? Yeah. It, it's yeah. it's it's not so much that um, giving the seller the benefit of the doubt. It's not so much that he's lying as that he's just some guy who bought this thing in 1970 and he's been running it himself ever right. since then, and he just doesn't have good records. You know, like he just, mm-hmm. he, 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 he's kind of guessing at, you know, he looks at what he told the IRS and says, yeah, that must be right. You know, and it, it, it just aren't good records, but yeah, Stephen is absolutely correct. Uh, uh, check and double check everything. And that's usually done, Stephen, after the property's under contract, right? You don't, you don't do all this stuff yes, when you have don't a have certain, a deal. Okay. Right. And it's longer. Yeah, the mechanic of mine is a, an auto repair shop. He knows someone, uh, sold, sold at the buyer got, Less with a six grand, uh, six grand bill. <laughs> mm. Yep. Oh. Yep. Also, keep, keep in mind too. You know, residential is pretty simple, right? You got plumbing, you got uh, the bathroom, how it functions. In commercial, things are always crazy. Different type of wire. One thing. This is I, a certain power box. If it's aluminum wire, insurance companies will not insure it. And so you, mm. these are just some things that you just have to learn. You have to go to the building and inspect it yourself. It's a lot mm. more hands-on. And But, like, there is a list of electrical boxes. I'm going to have to pull that up before I get to Ohio. But there's a, there's a list of several boxes that insurance companies will not insure. And so you can go buy a property, mm. pay cash, close it, and you can't get insurance on it. Mm. I mean, it's... You have to do your due diligence. You're going to have to know this. You know, you're going to have to spend the money of due diligence, which a, which a lot of people don't want to do. And you're going to have to buck up. If you if you want to do this right, hire professionals and get it done and get, hire an electrician, a licensed electrician to come into the building and inspect every single line and to know, is it compliance? Is it up to code? Because if it's not up to code, you're going to bring it up to code. Mm-hmm. And it's going to cost you more yeah. money. That's fine. But you need to do your due diligence and understand this going in. And you can't go back. And there's no way you can sue somebody. Mm-hmm. In commercial, there is no, like, um, what's that called, Dina, when a, um, you know, errors and omissions? Uh-huh. <laughs> like, there, 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 it's not like that. It's your SOL. You're in this game. Mm-hmm. And even your due diligence, if you pay for a title report, you pay – contractors and the check the the water lines you and you walk you pay for that that's on you you can't say you didn't tell me or you lied like in a single family home well the line was clogged and you know you can you have a case there because of negligence but the reality is there is none in commercial it's the wild west you're on your own yep. so get the right team all right. So thank you so much for your question. That's, uh, we, we yeah. really, really, uh, got, got Steve going there and, uh, good information, Sorry. Steve. Appreciate it. Um, let's go on to some questions that have come in via email. Uh, this one is from Steve, cool. who I happen to know is a commercial investor in Dayton. He says, the difference between residential and commercial real estate is that someone has to have a place to live, but a business does not need to exist. The office space has shown this in the past few years. How are you personally mitigating the risk of economic downturns causing higher vacancy in your commercial properties? So love this question and love his banter. You know, I had a commercial building. I still have it. It's 11,000 square foot. When COVID hit, I thought I was going to die. So then what you do is that you change the use of the building and you can be, 
you can be creative in it. You know, you see all the articles, they're changing malls into pickleball tournament, uh, pickleball <laughs> places. In my, in my building, I was going to put a ghost kitchen on the bottom floor and, you know, it, I, I didn't have to, all my tenants stayed, you know, but you have to be forward thinking and, and be able to pivot if you need to. Now, me personally, I would not buy any office buildings, it, you know, and I, I'm in a class C, office building and you know it works for that young entrepreneur or you know 500 to a thousand dollar price range but what fascinates me today is that class a office space is still being built and there's so much vacancy in office space i mean we in oklahoma we have more office space than we have uh i mean there's millions of square foot of vacant office space i don't get it Mm -hmm. And why are we building? I don't know. But you can change the use of the property. And when you hang around commercial people, they're, they're very creative. And that ghost kitchen idea didn't come from me. It came from somebody else. And, you know, because I was, I was worried. I was like, how could I fix this? Why don't you put a ghost kitchen in there? Perfect. Mm -hmm. Why don't you turn it into lofts? That's what's happening right now in some commercial properties. You know, Walmarts are turning into gymnasiums. Like there's crunch, crunch workout is going into an old grocery store. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, you know, I mean, purpose is going to be changed over time. But, you know, yes, I, I'm a conservative investor, so I I wouldn't buy office space Steven, regardless. Great, great answer. Great show. We are definitely going to have to do it again because we have left two questions in the email box unanswered. I am going to uh, encourage Kyle and uh, and Ed to maybe attend the Rio of Greater Cincinnati online meeting tomorrow night. Uh, it is, again, about commercial investing, this time with Tom Berry, who was a guest here a few weeks ago and is also a very experienced commercial investor. Maybe you can get your questions answered there. Everybody can come to that. You can get a registration link at CincinnatiRIA.com. We will be back next week with more information to put you on the path to financial independence through real estate investing. Until then, happy investing. Thanks for listening to the Savvy Radio Show. Glide online and listen to our other motivating episodes at SavvyRadioShow.com. Connect on Twitter at LandlordBook and always be buying assets.